Thanks, Joanne. It's, it's, it's my honor to um, tee up or introduce our closing session um, today, which is the Ed McCauley Lecture. And Ed is with us today. Ed, will you please stand up so we can recognize you for whom this great lecture is honored every year. Um, and our guest lecturer today is the Reverend Richard Joyner. The Macaulay Lecture was created in 1999 by the NCHA Board of Trustees um, and established as the C. Edward Macaulay Lecture Endowment. The Lecture Endowment honors the career of Ed and his leadership of over two decades with the NCHA. The Lecture is funded by the NCHA Foundation, the Duke Endowment, the Kate B. Reynolds Trust, and Premier. We are honored to have with us today the Reverend Richard Joyner. He serves as Nash UNC Healthcare's Director of Pastoral Cares, and he has done that for over 20 years. His pastoral care program involves about 35 volunteer chaplains and provides well over 8,000 hours a year in pastoral uh, care counseling to our patients. Um, and we also host a formal hospital-based pastoral care training program. The Reverend's education was from Pitt Community College and Shaw University Divinity School. He's also a veteran of the United States Army. But today we are here to recognize him for his other life's work as a rural church pastor and an award-winning founder of the Kanita Family Life Center. If we were to list all of Richard's accomplishments, my introduction would be longer than his presentation, but I'll mention just a few. 2011, he was recognized by the Rocky Mount Area Chamber of Commerce and named him the Distinguished Citizen of the Year. 2014, um, he was given the National Prize by the Encore organization known as the Purpose Prize, given to a community leader making a large-scale investment in people over the age of 60 who were combining their passion and experience for social good. His work in Canada has earned him speaking engagements at the CDC in Atlanta, National Health Community Conferences, um, and this fall is invited to give the keynote address at the Princeton Theological Seminary and their Family Life and Just Food Conference. Richard, look out, there are a bunch of Presbyterians up there, okay? So, um, I've been fortunate enough to work with Richard as this Kanita project has taken shape over the last decade. Kanita is a small town located in Edgecombe County in rural eastern North Carolina. The Family Life Center is a nonprofit entity that encourages gardening, healthy eating habits, and stress management as a way to improve health and vitality. Encouraged by Reverend Joyner and other church leaders, 60 youth lead five large-scale gardening efforts, including a 25-acre plot that includes two greenhouses and even produces honey and a bee bus. Last year, their farms harvested over 90, excuse me, over 50,000 pounds of fresh food, which was distributed to local low-income families in that area of our state. Most importantly, this effort has made a major impact on the health of Kanita's most disadvantaged residents. We are proud to report that the active participants of all ages have experienced dramatic decreases in chronic disease prevalence, medication use, visits to hospital ERs, and hospital admissions. The program emphasizes human development, as Richard calls it, by teaching children social skills, environmental stewardship, responsibility, business skills, and healthy living habits. Many of the children, we believe, have stayed in school due to their participation in this program. Richard's program is remarkable, and it has a lot to teach us about effective ways to both reach and heal disenfranchised communities. It is now a pleasure to see the Kanita Family Life Center gain national attention and widespread philanthropic support. Richard's program is remarkable in large measure because Richard is a remarkable person. Those who know him know him to be humble, self-effacing, and a guy that prefers to stay in the shadows rather than the limelight. But today we're going to ask Richard to shed a little light on us. I'm Mike Waldrum. I'm the new... Uh CEO at Viden Health, and I'm very honored to, to introduce uh, Reverend Joyner because he will show us that it's not about control. 
it's really about a changing environment and how do you engage in that environment to do the right thing. And it's about collaboration and leadership. And so I'm very honored to, to have gotten to know him a bit and to hear his inspiring story. And he asked if we would, if Biden would help kick this off. And I'm honored to represent Biden Health because I think um, our involvement has been instrumental in that journey and that we started by giving the seed funding um, a number of years ago to help help this initiative forward and we continue to do so. Let me first thank you for having me to be here. Um, as my mom would say, what a Baptist preacher having to be up in here. <laughs> But I'm so thankful to be here, and thanks to Mike and Larry and Wick Baker, who in our regional hospitals, and uh, just, just excited about uh, what is happening in our region and so many other people that participate. My first year there at Kanita Family Life Center, uh, we had 30 funerals. And most of those funerals, believe it or not, was people in their 30s. And uh, really, uh, our average income in this area is $21,000 a year. Um, um, single parenting, a lot of, lot of things happening. Uh, I decided, since I'm a Baptist preacher, chaplain, I should pray and ask God what he wanted me to do. So I was sitting in the car, pulling on the road, and started praying. And a uh, week I heard a voice. I was praying, said, open your eyes, look around you, what's... What do you see? Now, I'm a share, I grew up sharecropping, and, and that was the last thing I ever thought I wanted to do, and I still don't want to do it. <laughs> so uh, I opened my eyes, looked around, Mike, and uh, all I saw was land. And I said, I don't get this. I said, is there anybody else up there I can talk to? <laughs> <laughs> so no one else came to be. But So we started Kanita Family Life Center in 207. Uh, to increase access to healthy food, we were diagnosed as a food desert, that we really didn't have access to fresh, locally grown food. And uh, uh, one of the nutritionists said to me that 98% of disease could be treated through dietary with access to healthy food, so we started this, decided we would start this garden to provide access to healthy food and to educate our community on, on the opportunities that, that food could bring. We decided we can do a summer camp with it. We could put food on people's table, and we could reduce those things that are called social barriers. Edgecombe County was number 98th in our county report cards on social barriers, what really means that if you gave us everything we needed, that we still couldn't process it. And so we decided that we were going to try to uh, do reduce these social barriers. So um, one Sunday, I decided to stand up in the church and say, look, this summer we're going to have a summer camp, and we were going to make sure that everybody had access so it's going to be free. And, uh, um, and we're going to be an agriculture, agribusiness summer camp with technology, uh, access to healthy food. We we're going to deal with some genetics around food, uh, and we were going to make sure that, that it started at 5.30 in the morning, uh, and uh, we were going to do physical exercise the first part of the morning, and the rest of the day we are going to break up into four sections. We were going to go to the garden that we hadn't started. We were going to do an uh, integrate uh, course uh, with the integrate uh, test and look at what were those, those things we need to work on over the summer, and we are going to work on social skills. Now, surely with that, no one is going to show up, you know. I was sure that um, no one was going to show up. Uh, well, when that Monday, I got a call from the church, my deacon that says, uh, you need to get over here. I said, I'm at work. He said, you need to get to the church right now. I said, what, something burning up? Uh, what's happening? He said, that cockamamie idea you said from the pulpit? We got a hundred children out here, and they're tearing the church up. And you better get over here. So I, I decided that I would ask the community who would help. Again, 
nobody from my Christian standpoint came up, but there was a Muslim, Minister Muhammad and his staff said, we will help. And I said, okay, Baptist church, Muslim minister, you get voted out for this kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, and, and the students, I asked the students, I said, well, how's camp going? And they said, it's going real good. It's, it's, we, we're getting here. I would show up at 530 to do the calisthenics. They said, but the guy that you got running this camp, he sleep a lot. What do you mean sleep? So three day, three, you know, every three times a, a day, he take out this rug, <laughs> and he go and take a nap. <laughs> and he come back. I, they said, but he's okay, but he just do it all the time. That's okay. That's fine. And, and so another process we started with our bees, the beekeeping program. Our youth is involved. Two things don't get involved. Youth, you know, anybody got children, you try to control them, you know. So we put our youth on the board, and, and they decided that uh, with this whole process that they, will, they wanted to talk about the iPad, everything. You start talking, they can pull out the phone. And if you're not right, they can tell you. And so they decided that we would grow better vegetables if we had bees to pollinate it. And uh, as you saw, we had 36 children in the after school. We had 80 some students in the summer camp. I didn't know we want another bee to mess with. The children were bees enough. And we decided we wouldn't, I decided we wouldn't have, uh, have bees, but they said, we're on the board of directors and pastor, we need to vote. Well, I got outvoted. <laughs> we ended up with bees in our summer camp. One of the social barriers that we talk about is, is the, the whole concept of looking at the family of bees, our youth getting involved, you know, looking at that uh, our area is taking in $21,000 per household. We wasn't going to increase that process. The whole educational system with our youth getting involved, the bee operation is the biggest piece we got because they have learned creative thinking that now they have over 150 beehives. And they are marking their honey and, and Lowe's food uh, at, um, uh, they, they have it over at Wick, have it over in, in his uh, store at the hospital uh, by the honey. And we have it at four uh, grocery stores and we're, we're now marketing that honey, and they, out of $21,000, the youth has saved $24,000 in our own scholarship fund that none of it came from the church nor parents. Mm. <laughs> this is Tashiana. Tashiana is one of the youth. Um, it's amazing what you learn about youth. Uh, Tashiana uh, come from a family with a lot hard a history of diabetes. Uh, her great uncles, the eight of them died before they were 50 from diabetes. And so Tashiana, um, the president of uh, nutritionist group came to Rocky Mountain because Rocky Mountain strong cities. Uh, and, and so when they got there, they didn't have a lot for them to do. They said, send them to Canada and um, Maybe they'll show them something. So they came out to Canada, and we decided that we were going to let Tashian and Miss Bunch, that I'll tell you about later on, do a demonstration. Tashiana's father had just died a month before that. And we really said, Tashiana, you don't have to do it. She said, I want to do it. Plus, she, uh, this, she was eight years old when she took her first, when we decided the 12 students to, had to be beekeepers. Uh, we decided that at eight years old, you couldn't, pay, you, you couldn't become a certified beekeeper. She challenged the state because she said, it shouldn't matter my age. If I'm able to produce and I'm qualified, I should be a beekeeper. She challenged Edgecombe County and won. She became an eight-year-old beekeeper. Now she's 12, so she's going to be a master beekeeper before she graduates. And so we want her to talk to them about her beekeeping. So she stood up and uh, she said, 
Pastor Joan, I don't want to talk about that. I said, oh, my God. What's going to happen? She said, I want to tell why I came to the garden. And she said, I came to the garden because I heard that if healthy foods would be able to change the genetics and help stabilize the family. And I'm like, whoa. She said, my father was, was uh, on dialysis, and I wanted my father to live long enough so he could see me graduate. And she says, for the last couple of years, I've been making sure that my father would get access to this food, and it did happen. She said, last, my, last month, my father died from diabetes, and, um, and, and all of a sudden, everybody's heart just dropped like we're doing here now. And tears start streaming out of her eyes. And I was Tasha, she said, no, I want to finish. And she said, my father was on dialysis. And she said, I had to make a decision. She said, would I quit the camp and forget it, or would I keep going? She said, but I made another decision that my six-year-old sister and my 17-year-old brother and myself will not die on dialysis. That's my next goal, and I'm going to stick with it. And boy, she became our champ. <laughs> Access to healthy food. Miss Bunch, the one you hear talking about that um, she, um, she came off the medications. She came off, but she was one of my biggest fighters. When I stood up and said we would have no more fried chicken and, and would not have no more sweets and stuff, Miss Bunch started a campaign to vote me out of the church. She said we didn't hire him to meddle in our food. We hired him to, to preach, and that's not preaching. And she got with the deacon and said, we're going to get him out of here. And so this, you know, access to healthy food changed Miss Bunch's life. We were going through Lent. We're in Lent season right now. We decided that we would not do fried foods and stuff. Miss Bunch is the most vocal person. She said, I'm going to do it, but as soon as it's over, I'm going back to eating everything I want to eat. So fine, Ms. Bunch, do it. And between that time, she had, a, she had a doctor visit. She went to the doctor, and he was like, um, you know, Ms. Bunch, what have you been doing? And she said, don't tell me nothing else about my health. He said, no, no, your, your blood pressure and things are looking great. And she said, what? He said, what you been doing? And she said, well... I haven't eaten a lot of pig feet, and I, I did change my diet. He said, you need to stay on it. And all of a sudden, Miss Bunch came back, and she was my biggest advocate. After coming off those 21 medications, Miss Bunch was in, uh, she bought a new car. And some of the other ladies at the church said, the pastor must be helping you out. She said, I'm saving money. And it's amazing that how much she started saving. She, she was $1,000 a month just trying to take care of her food and medicine. She came off those medications, um, and she reduced her medical bills. And 80% of the congregation after Ms. Bunch is participating. Next slide. Lay Health Program. And so now we have, have involved in uh, 21 other churches around the area. Has, has now, we're, the goal is to put two lay health coaches in each one of these churches by zip code and then looking at the GPS, begin to narrow down uh, how we can make the community the most healthiest place around. I believe the best way to gauge the health of the hospital is gauge it through the community. You know, if the community is healthy, the hospital gonna be healthy. And so 
we now, with the help of, of, of Ari Ahek, uh, Broder School of Madison, and others, that we have, we're training, the, the training started this February, that we're going to roll out 20 lay health advisors that we're going to put in these churches to deal with barriers of discharge, emergency room use, uh, discharge planning, actually working in the hospital. We started out with 34 churches. We've got over 70 churches now that are going to have access to the hospital and going to have access to patient discharge that we're not going to discharge just in some global place, but we're going to discharge in a place that can maintain the health that the hospital is producing. And we're happy about that transparency. <laughs> Our next slide. And so this is what we're doing. We're sowing seeds of change, literally sowing seeds of change, breaking those barriers that normally hospital and churches and communities normally do not have anything to do with each other. But now we're seeing that change. I mean, our Health Sundays, that now we're standing up preaching on Health Sundays, serving a healthy meal, having a congregation to understand what are their challenges and begin to break those challenges. We're doing 34 health, health fairs a year uh, with OIC taking the mobile van, van to the churches, screenings, and setting up chronic disease management in the church. Opportunity for patients, for we better not call them patients, <laughs> but for members to come to church and to be able to see a primary health care person, to see a health educator, to see a nutritionist, and to have a plan for their health in the community. And so I just want to thank you for having me here today, having us here today. We believe that we're going to grow seeds of change, not only the eastern part of North Carolina, but how many know health care, as Larry said, I close out with, the most expensive place to do health care is in the hospital. The most reasonable and sustainable way and sustainable way to do health care is in the community. And that's our goal, is to do health care in the community. And my closing is self-sustainable because Mike, Larry, and Wick is taking the food that we're growing and figuring out how to reduce all of those barriers and get our food, the vegetables, and everything we're growing on the table in the hospital. And 98% of those dollars is put back in sustaining these programs. 2% go into the scholarship funds of these youth. And how many know that the best thing one day, we won't have to ask for a grant. We're going to learn how to invest back in each other. Thank you for allowing me to be here.